first 11 chapters, principles of righteousness that Paul's laid out, kind of the theological section uh, of the book. And, um, uh, and then last week, uh, we began the, more of the practical, and he begins by saying that, therefore, because of everything else that we've studied in view of God's mercies that we've been uh, learning about, that we're saved by grace, uh, by grace alone, all that the Lord has done for us, then the natural consequence to that uh, would be to commit yourself uh, fully uh, to the Lord. Uh, then we won't be conformed to the pattern or thinking of this world, but we'll be able to be transformed from it by the renewing our minds. Uh, then we'll be able to test and know what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and perfect will is. And then he transitions from that now into verse 3 to 8 uh, in talking about uh, uh, gifts of the Spirit. He's used use of the word gifts, but he's not talking about your natural abilities, uh, your ability to tap dance is not a gift of the Spirit. Uh, you may be gifted in a lot of areas, uh, but this is talking about spiritual gifts that God gives to every person when they come uh, to faith in Jesus Christ, gifts or gifts, uh, and that he does that primarily, we'll see, for the, the building up of the body of Christ. So because of that, he starts out with a warning about pride. And then uses the illustration of our physical bodies as an example of what the body of Christ is uh, supposed to function uh, uh, and be like. And, uh, and there's very much the uh, parallel passage over in 1 Corinthians 12 that we'll make uh, reference to. I'm kind of uh, trying to help us illustrate that uh, in, uh, in the idea of, uh, of canoe paddling. I've got a little... A little slide up there, and uh, you could uh, pray for David uh, Beatty. Uh, uh, he's uh, he qualified uh, last week for states to be headed to uh, Hanalei uh, next week, and he's uh, he's the steersman. He's a very important guy in that uh, in that boat. I think he's 14 and under, and uh, been paddling for Kailua for uh, a couple of years. Uh, but everybody in that boat uh, is in there for a particular function. And uh, I never did the competitive thing, but I did get to paddle a little bit uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, younger uh, on Kauai and got to actually paddle with, uh, you know, I didn't realize at the time, the guy's kind of a, a legend, Percy Kinimaka. I learned uh, surfing from a guy named Duke Kahanamoko. So he kind of grew up as a beach boy. He's a young guy in the early 60s, went to Kauai and a surfer types that would hang out on the beach all day long. Occasionally, he would need some help with the tourists taking them out. But he wouldn't just take them out for a paddle. He'd actually take them into the surf break and <laughs> like head high waves. <laughs> and it was fun. Uh, but uh, everything in that boat is supposed to move in unity. Everybody can paddle and exert a certain amount of energy. But the idea is that if everybody follows the stroker setting in the number one position, and pulls together at the same time. That's what propels the boat and gets it uh, moving. They've got to move in a unity or it's not going to happen. The <clears throat> kind of a contemporary Hawaiian word for that is lokahi. Lokahi can mean a lot of different things, peaceful and so forth, but it literally sometimes means to pull together. And that's what needs to happen uh, in the boat if it's going to move forward. Uh, and that's what has to happen in terms of the body of Christ, in terms of the gifts and the way they operate, they need to pull together. Same time, a unity. But he's also going to speak about the diversity because we're not all the same uh, and we're not the same in function. Uh, and that's important as well. And certainly that's as true of every position uh, within the, the boat. So it's a good illustration for us. And let's look first at the, uh, the warning against pride, verse 3. For I say... Uh, through the grace given to me to everyone. Notice who is this for? It's for everyone. We're not just talking to the leaders of the church or anybody. It's to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So we're not to allow pride to affect our view of ourselves. And again, the language here, very much alive. It could be Translated, uh, I say to everyone, do not super think of yourselves or do not get hyper about yourselves. And were there Paul knew individuals uh, in the church there in Rome he was speaking to? We don't know, but certainly uh, this is something that's uh, a tendency within us humans. Uh, and it takes on two forms. One is more the classical. This is the person that we would say is a legend in their own mind. And uh, just a lovely person to be around, the self-elevating braggart. And, uh, 
Uh, how many have worked for somebody like that? What, what do these guys raise at the top? I, I don't know, but uh, everything's got to be their idea, and you've always got to, you know, uh, plant the seed in their mind first if you're going to get something done so it can be their idea. Uh, but it's the person that's elevated. Paul says in regards to functioning within the church, within the body of Christ, when he begins to talk about spiritual gifts, he says, I need to deal with this issue for first. And is this an issue in churches where spiritual gifts are prevalent? Well, I can just tell you by experience, uh, it is. They even get into a classification of who's got the most important gifts, although we're going to find out that's crazy because Jesus gives them. We don't get to pick. It's by his grace. It's just what he does. Uh, yet there's a lot of confusion in this issue. Uh, and I think it's interesting as he begins, he warns us against pride. The second form of pride is the person that is uh, the person more uh, subtle, the self-deprecating person. Oh, I'm really, I'm really nothing. I'm just, you know, I don't deserve and I, I just don't, you know. And of course, then you want to jump in and go, oh, no. Hey, you're, you're awesome. You're just a wonderful person. You shouldn't think that way. Oh, thank you very much. Because that's what they want, right? They want you to say to them how, how awesome they are. Uh, it's, it's still pride. Uh, e either either way. And Paul says, don't think more highly of ourselves than we should. No, it's not that we shouldn't think of ourselves at all. There are some things we can think about, the fact that God loves us tremendously, uh, that the Bible says we're his treasure, that we're precious in his sight. Uh, those are all fine things to consider in terms of God's love for me, what he's done for me. But the negative warning here, don't think more highly than you should. Then he gives the positive, but rather think of yourself soberly, or as one translation in IV says, with sober judgment. Uh, Peter uses the same word in 1 Peter 4, 7, when he says, but the end of all things is at, a, is at hand, therefore be serious, that's our word, be serious and watchful in your, in your prayers. <laughs> it's used in Mark 5, 15, when Jesus cast the demon out of the uh, the <clears throat> demoniac in uh, Gadara, who, you know, when they, uh, uh, he has legions of demons in him and so forth. And you remember that scene and Jesus cast the demons out of him. Uh, and then at the end of that verse, it says, and then he was in his right mind. That, that's our word as well. In other words, to be boastful and proud in the context of church, the body of Christ, <clears throat> and spiritual gifts, <clears throat> you're not in your right mind. <clears throat> you're not serious. You're not sober when you're, when you're thinking that way. Because again, as the title of the message, we're gifted members of, of one body. Uh, secondly, the pride will not be an issue if we look to the measure of faith God has given us. That's at the end of verse 3, where it says, as God has dealt to each one <clears throat> a measure of faith. Now, uh, interesting, I, I read one writer that said that measure of faith can also be translated standard. And then he wanted to say that the standard of faith, of course, should be Jesus Christ. So if we compare ourselves to the standard of faith, which is Jesus, there's no way we're going to be prideful because we're going to fall short uh, each and every time. Uh, Paul warns the false apostles uh, uh, writing to the church in Corinth uh, that when you uh, measure yourselves by yourselves, you're not wise. And that can be our tendency. Well, Because I'm, I'm never as bad as the other guy. We can always find someone that's worse than us. Uh, to elevate ourselves. Uh, but when we do that, in a sense, we're not serious. Uh, we're not in our right uh, mind. But we also need a measure of faith. And it simply says, God has dealt or given to each one uh, a measure of faith. And, uh, and we certainly need that in terms of the exercise of spiritual gifts. Uh, and, you know, and, and again, uh, this is a big subject. You know, we're not going to be able to, this is not a comprehensive uh, uh, teaching on, on spiritual gifts at all. We could spend several weeks on it, of course, because it's mentioned several times in the New Testament. But uh, it is important to recognize that, well, sometimes faith is required uh, just to exercise uh, a spiritual gift. Uh, we need faith in God if we're going to be pleasing to him, even to start with. That's what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11.6. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Uh, we need faith in the gifts themselves. There's some people that don't have faith in the gifts that they're even for today, uh, that they uh, have any, any impact uh, on our lives at all, uh, regardless of what the New Testament says, regardless of what we see uh, in the book of Acts. 
because there's such abuse in this area uh, of spiritual gifts. And, uh, and I've seen it, and I, I've been around the abuse, and I can understand then the thinking that we should just say they have ceased and they no longer are in operation for today. So those folks are called cessationists because they don't believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today. They relegate that to the uh, first century church. And, uh, and once uh, the book of Acts concluded, once we had the full canon in Scripture, it was kind of a done deal and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously there's nothing in the Bible to indicate that. And in fact, what we do find is that they will be in operation until the day that Jesus Christ returns back uh, to planet Earth. Uh, so it requires faith just to believe that the gifts are for today, apparently. And we need faith in the Holy Spirit and the operation of, of the gifts. So an important ele element in uh, spiritual gifts. Now, it's interesting, Paul's larger discourse is in 1 Corinthians. Spends all of chapter 12, spends all of chapter 14 talking about spiritual gifts. I don't think it's any coincidence that 1 Corinthians 13, sandwiched in between, in context of spiritual gifts, is the chapter on love. Love is patient, love is kind, and so forth. Uh, the description of, of what unconditional love is all about. Because I think that's an important element as well. If we're going to operate in spiritual gifts, uh, if we're going to fulfill their purpose, which is, well, to bless others, to build up the body of Christ, pride is, pride is going to be a problem. Uh, and uh, and also is going to be a problem if things are not done in uh, in love, uh, because again in many settings spiritual gifts operate for the benefit of the person that wants to be seen and that wants to be vocal, wants to be heard, wants to everyone to know they've got something special uh, about them and so forth. But that's com because it, that's completely contrary uh, to Paul's teaching here in at First Corinthians. We also need faith for the purpose of the gifts. And I've, uh, I've just mentioned it. It should be to bless other people. The gifts are really not for us. If you have a particular gift, it's for other people. Uh, and therefore, uh, it operates in the context of a group or with others. And there's one exception to that. And uh, so I want to point that out as the exception so that in a sense we can move on with what the purpose is. And we find uh, that in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 2. Paul's going to contrast two gifts here, the gift of speaking in tongues and the gift of prophecy. He's going to say that one is for the individual, you, only you. And the other one, uh, again, is for uh, a group or for others. Uh, and that, that contrast continues. Again, it says pursue love. Very important if we're going to have anything to do with spiritual gifts. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. I'm not sure if I'm really interested in what you're saying. Well, the Bible says you should actually desire. It's interesting in the NIV, it says eagerly desire uh, spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. So there's an exception when someone is speaking in a, this is the idea of an unknown tongue that we find in the book of Acts. It's not for the benefit of others, because no one can understand it. It's only for the benefit of that one individual. Verse 3, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies uh, the church. So that's the one gift that is the exception. It only benefits the person himself, and therefore that's why we sometimes call it a private prayer language because it's given for the context of building up an individual in their own private uh, prayer life. Is that how it operates in churches today? <laughs> no, it gets, uh, it gets uh, pretty wild. And I, I preach in quite a few Pentecostal churches. And I have to tell you, it's fun. There's a lot of action. But, uh, and, uh, but you, you kind of get this sense that um, uh, it's almost like... Uh, well, people are looking, you know, they're looking for this emotional thing and stuff, and they're, they're uh, anticipating it, and, uh, and uh, they love the Lord and everything, but uh, again, Paul lays out some very explicit instructions for the purpose of the gifts and how they should even operate. He makes this one exception here. It's for an individual, but everything else, as we'll look at the seven gifts here, 
uh, in Romans is meant for the, well, to bless others, for the edifying, the building up uh, of, of the church. So in, in order to understand the purpose and bless, bless others, we need, to, we need knowledge about the gifts and how they operate. We need faith, a measure of which is given to us uh, from God. And we also need more than knowledge, because knowledge puffs up. Uh, we need the love of God to overwhelm our hearts if these things are really going to function uh, the way they, they should. And just by the way, they do. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's just fun to watch. And, and I think that sometimes we're just uh, unaware of what our gifting is or what it isn't is. And, and I think you might uh, be able to recognize uh, the gifts, at least the ones we're going to go through this morning, and, and see that, well, that pretty much happens about every Sunday uh, around here. And, uh, and that's why that person is so over the top in, in that way for that thing. It's just a, well, it's just a gift that God has, uh, has given them. But there's a warning against pride here. And again, if we couple that with the need for faith and Paul's exhortation for love, uh, it'll set a good foundation for what else he wants to say. <clears throat> so secondly, in verse in 4 and 5, we're going to notice, again, that physical bodies become the example uh, of the church. Verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually uh, members of one another. So uh, the first thing we'd like to say is that our physical bodies, <clears throat> in them we must have unity. That's in verse 4. For as we have many members... In one body, verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ, the need for, uh, for unity. Uh, and certainly that's true of our physical bodies. In your physical body, when your physical body begins to not have unity, when it begins to compete with itself, we have a medical term for that, it's called cancer. And, uh, and we don't want that in the body of Christ. Uh, and, and that's why even things of a competitive nature within the church can be a problem. Like men's softball, for example. I just thought I'd throw that in. And so it doesn't mean that you don't do those things, but you have to be highly aware that this could go south real quick here. Uh, and you have to work really hard uh, in making sure we're redeeming this competitive nature of things. And, uh, and there's different ways of, of doing it, but uh, uh, having lousy players helps because how serious can you get you know, if you can't even get a hit? <coughs> So we, I try to fulfill that role, but um, now we had one guy for a while. He would, uh, he was, uh, he had been a serious player at one time and uh, was keenly aware of the problem. So he would just, he was just kind of the, the clown out there, and he would uh, go out sometimes and uh, and actually come up to play. And he was a, he was a, he was a big guy, and he would start yelling and screaming at the pitcher, and I'm going to drive this ball down your throat. I'm going to blah 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 and all this stuff. And then he's like, what is he doing? And then the, the pitch would come, and then he would swing and miss and spin like three times in circles like a cartoon character and then fall flat on his back. <laughs> it's like, okay, we're, we're having fun again. But uh, uh, competition, uh, not necessarily good. Unity, uh, not competition. What makes us one? Well, we have the same nature. Peter talks about that. We've been studying about it in Romans. When we come to faith in Christ, we're born again. We receive a new nature. Uh, Peter says, By which you have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. That's, that's a new nature, the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And it's, uh, and it's fun, I mean, to have this, this unity that when we come together, there's this commonality because we're all saved. Uh, we've all had our sins forgiven. We're given a new nature. Uh, we love God. We love his word. Uh, there's just that we can be completely diverse in so many other ways. But at the same time, there's this unity that can be there and should be there. Jesus says in John 15, 5, the classic, I'm the vine and you are the branches. It's uh, all of us. There's this uh, commonality in our relationship with Christ. In John 17, when Jesus is praying for the church, this is what he's praying for, uh, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Uh, Jesus is here praying that uh, people would see a distinction and a difference uh, in our unity and in our lives, and by it they would know that God the Father had sent Jesus into this world. 
He continues on in verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect or mature uh, in one. Very important, obviously, to Jesus. We don't have too many prayers where he's specifically praying for the church yet to come. Uh, but this is one of those prayers in John 17, talking about uh, unity. Uh, the second thing is uh, our physical bodies have diversity. As uh, we mentioned in the uh, outrigger canoe example, again, there's, uh, they have to pull together, but there are different positions in that boat, and they all play a different role. They all play a, a different function. And Paul goes into detail about that in 1 Corinthians 12. We all can't be an eye. We all can't be an ear. We all can't be a toe. Uh, but, uh, but we need everybody for the body to function. And certainly we need that uh, within the, the church as well. We see that in verse 4. Uh, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. We don't have the same function. We all do different things. Uh, and that's going to become evident in terms of our giftings. And again, one of the reasons we want to recognize whatever gift or gifts that we have so that we can function in them, grow in them, so then uh, all the functions, uh, uh, yeah, all the places in the boat are filled and we're moving forward uh, in unity and God's kingdom is being built and it becomes a witness to the world that Jesus has come. Uh, the great scholar F.F. F. Bruce says, Diversity, not uniformity, is the mark of God's handiwork. It is so in nature, it is so in grace too. And nowhere more th so than in the Christian communi community. Here are many men and women with the most diverse kinds of parentage, environment, temperament, and capacity. But to be able to have this diversity uh, and the unity uh, at the same time. And uh, we probably got more of it here in Hawaii than about anywhere else on the planet, oh, by the way, in terms of our diversity uh, and yet uh, the unity that we can have, just in terms of our, our backgrounds and where we come from. Uh, and it's just such a, a blessing to be able to come together. And it's such a witness uh, to, uh, to the world. I just remember one of the, uh, uh, doing that when we used to do kayaking trips uh, over uh, on the big island, <clears throat> and one of the guys we brought with us was, uh, was uh, a friend of my uh, brother-in-law's who came, wasn't a believer, but he agreed to come on the trip. And we have Bible studies and worship times. We, just, and we have, have a great time and stuff. And uh, after about the, the second day, I asked him how, how he was doing, what he thought of things. And he, he, said, he said, you have to appreciate his little local uh, terminology. He goes, oh, this is better than Vegas. <laughs> Took that as a compliment. <laughs> from him I take that as a compliment better than Vegas I said why he says oh you guys you got some kind of natural high or something <laughs> because we're all laughing and hollering he goes yeah you're not even drinking nothing you know because we were and uh, but you know we just have a good time and, uh, uh, and it, it's the diversity with the unity uh, can be such a witness to to the world Paul uses again the same picture as I mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, there are diversities of gift, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. The diversity. Unity with the diversity. And then, like our physical bodies, there are what we might say mutuality or a mutual dependence. Verse 5, again, so we being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Individually, we're members of one another. There's supposed to be uh, an interdependence uh, upon uh, each other. And certainly that's one of Paul's points over there in 1 Corinthians when he points out the fact that uh, when one member rejoices, we all can rejoice. When one mourns or hurts, we all mourn together. And that's true of your body, isn't it? I mean, my body, when my, my back uh, hurts, uh, the rest of my body feels so much compassion that it'll stay up all night with my sore back. It's just, you know, it's just such a blessing you know, to, uh, that my body cares the way it does when one, another part is hurting. Uh, and that's Paul's illustration of the physical body, saying that, and that's the way it is, should be within the body of Christ, uh, which uh, leads me to saying, 
despite the movie that's out right now, there should be no lone rangers in the body of Christ. And pretty much you can't be a lone ranger uh, and be a healthy Christian. Uh, and you certainly can't be a lone ranger and function in terms of any spiritual gift or gift giftings, because some it's singular, sometimes plural, <clears throat> that God has given. Oh, Lord, I thank you. You've given me the spiritual gift. I just don't want to use it because I don't like being around those people. You know, it's like, well, you can do that, but you're never going to mature. You're never going to grow in Christ. You'll never grow in that gift. You'll never be the blessing to others that God has intended you to be. But when it's all operating, it's uh, it's a beautiful, it's an awesome thing. So we need to be rightly thinking about ourselves. Uh, if we're a legend in our own mind, uh, we're not going to really be operating in the gifts the way that we, uh, that we should. Uh, we need to recognize that uh, we're like a physical body and that we need to have a unity to lokahi, to pull together in recognize the diversity that's within that. We're, we're just very different. And actually, that's awesome. That's a, <clears throat> that's, that's a great thing. And when that's not the case, it's creepy. I mean, I've, I've been at churches where every, everybody there looked the same. And their haircut was the same. And it wasn't on a military base. Uh, <laughs> that's different. That's different. But uh, when everybody haircuts the same, so the guys, they dress the same. I mean, right down to the, uh, the shoes, it's, uh, it's a little creepy. It's like, um, why are we doing this, by the way? I mean, uh, but, you know, it's these, we, we get these... Uh, cultural things you know that uh, that uh, that we bring into the body of Christ uh, thinking we have to have uniformity no unity in pulling together for a common purpose is one thing for the kingdom of God but there's diversity uh, in the middle of that and then that mutual dependence upon one another and none of that will happen if there's pride in the middle of it that leads us to the gifts themselves in verses 6 to 8 our gifts are to be used to fulfill their ultimate purpose. And as we go through the list here, uh, we'll note what the purpose of each one is. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it uh, in our ministry. Uh, he who teaches in teaching, he who uh, exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who sows, uh, shows mercy uh, with cheerfulness. So uh, the purpose of our gifts should be seen well in the source. I mentioned this already, but verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the, the what? The grace that is it's given. Uh, if you have a spiritual gift, you didn't earn it. You know, you, uh, uh, and, and, and just let me tell you how, how wild this can get. There are, there are some on the extreme of, of the gifts that uh, some, the extreme would say, uh, unless you have a particular gift, in this case speaking in tongues, you're not saved. Well, I'd say that's, uh, it says here they're just given by, by grace. Uh, we had one of the young gals grow up in the church at Calvary Honolulu uh, that went to a, a college, a liberal arts college on the mainland, and the, uh, the uh, background of the school was uh, one of the uh, Pentecostal denominations. <clears throat> and uh, she had a very uh, beautiful voice. She sang in the choir and everything. But for example, uh, with their thinking of spiritual gifts, she could be in the choir, but she could never sing a solo because she didn't speak in tongues. So could you just like fake it? Just blah, 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 something. And go, yeah, I got it. Let me, let me sing the solo. Uh, no, I wouldn't suggest that. But, um, <laughs> but, but it, what it does, it says that someone that has this gift has a status and everything else, you're a second class citizen. I'm pretty sure it just said it's by grace that they're given. How could, how could you have a certain status? And uh, as we'll see, it is that, do you get to pick which, which gifts you get? No. Should we eagerly seek spiritual gifts? Yes. Uh, but we don't really get to pick which one and they're given uh, by grace. Uh, and we're to use them for honor, but not ours. It's for the, uh, uh, the honor of God. Listen to Paul's own testimony about grace in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says, the only thing I got going for me is the grace of God. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, 
but the grace of God which was in me. Who I am and what I do, see Paul says it's all by the, by the grace of God, and that's true of spiritual gifts as well, and we should see that as the source uh, of spiritual gifts, God's grace. Secondly, the purpose of our gifts should be seen, well, there's a few simple truths about it. And I just kind of wanted to run through a couple of things, some I've already mentioned, because it's such a big subject and there's so much uh, misunderstanding out there. Um, one is that uh, we all have a gift or gifts. No Christian is left out. We started this thing. He says, and to everyone, he's speaking to everyone. Uh, and uh, over in 1 Corinthians, when he spends more time on this, in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, he says there are diversity of gifts. Some of this I've already read, but we'll, I'd like to get a running start here. There are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. What's given? It's given to each one. Everyone? Yeah. The manifestation of the Spirit in terms of gifts is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing uh, by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit works all these, distributing to each one according to, as he wills. I wanted to sign up for the miracle one. That, that sounded very good to me, you know. No, don't get to kind of sign up. What do I got to do to get that one? Uh, well, you don't. They're, they're just, it's Jesus decides. You could pray. You could pray. I kind of like that one, Lord. I try to use it for your glory. I think you can do that. But basically, Jesus gives these gifts by his grace. Nobody deserves anything. And it's for the purpose of edifying, blessing others, with that one exception, when you're alone and you can uh, use that gift, if you have that particular gift. But different kinds of service, he says, that's opportunities. Different kinds of working, capacity, uh, and so forth. As we go into the gifts, I mean, some people may have a gift of teaching, uh, and, uh, and they're awesome with uh, 10 and 12 people. Uh, but they're not too good in terms of a crowd of 500. It's a different, it's the same gift, that somebody else might have, but it's a different capacity. Uh, and that's not to say that as you use a gift, it can't be developed, uh, because you can learn in faith to trust the Lord for, uh, for greater things. But within the church, there's different gifts given uh, by the Holy Spirit and different opportunities. Uh, the list is not exhaustive. And uh, uh, on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse four, uh, and also 14, 1 Peter has got a list uh, some people list uh, 15 gifts, others uh, 19, others 20, uh, 22. Uh, so the one thing that we obviously see is that uh, they're never the same. Uh, some of them are mentioned more than once. Some of them are only mentioned uh, once. Uh, I don't think any of them are meant to be exhaustive because uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't see the gift of hula in there, and I'm pretty sure that's one of them, for example. Uh, but uh, different gifts uh, can be used by, uh, by God. In terms of our list here in Romans, some would say that it's a sampling and that there are more, and I think that's true. Uh, some would say it's a summary of all the other gifts, and there's other gifts kind of fall into one of these categories uh, that, are, uh, that are here. I'm not sure that that's true, but I think uh, they are there to illustrate Paul's point. I'm not going to give you all the gifts. For example, here's some gifts, uh, and they are not going to function if pride is an issue. Uh, they're not going to function properly if you don't see yourself as one in the body of Christ, uh, recognizing the unity that you must have. For example, <clears throat> uh, there is no gift of criticism. I just thought I'd mention that. Somebody may think they have that. I'm good at it. Pretty sure it's a gift. I just lay it on anybody about any time. No, that's, that's not helping us here. That's, that's not, not, you go back to the unity. Yeah, that's diversity, but it's not going to help us in the, in the unity category. Uh, uh, no, that's not, not really a gift. Uh, gifts are, uh, I like what writer, one writer said, gifts are not to be utilized as Christian zodiacs. There's a Leo. There's a Pisces. There's an administrator. There's a teacher. There's an Aquarius. No, it's not to pigeonhole people uh, to say that uh, they have that one gift. That's uh, all they do. That's uh, what they're all about and, uh, and so forth. 
uh, whether you have the, uh, the gift of mercy or not, uh, if the trash can's full, just take it out. It's, you know, you know, if you have the gift of uh, mercy, you might already be on it. But uh, uh, you know, there's the, the gift of, of giving. No, that doesn't leave you out. I don't think I have that gift. Just, just I'll just keep all my money myself, unless the Lord gives me that. No, we, we all show mercy. Uh, we all can show hospitality. Uh, we can all help. Uh, we all get. So these are, in some sense, uh, there's just things that we function as the church. Uh, but the gifting part is when somebody has something in it's just, wow, that's uh, kind of over the top there. That's, he's really good at that. I, I'm amazed at, um, and I can just tell you from just kind of a Calvary Chapel background, uh, it's a little different now with guys like Pete that get raised up to go to the Bible college and uh, do internships. And they're getting really uh, so much more equipped before they go out to, uh, uh, to minister. But uh, uh, kind of in my era, you just did what you did for a living. You started teaching a Bible study and then uh, somebody like uh, absolutely not knowing what you're doing. And then, uh, and then Bill would say, okay, and I want you to give the, uh, the sermon on Sunday. Why? Well, you, know, you know, and then you go through all the, the trauma of, uh, over, over that. And, uh, but what's amazing about that is listening to, to some of the other guys uh, that got raised up at the same time. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, guys are working in grocery stores. Guys are working for Hawaiian Tel. Yeah, I mean, it's like zip as far as theological training background. Or they give up and give us pretty good sermons. It's like, wow, that was pretty good. The gift of teaching. See, it, 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 it really wasn't. It was just a, uh, the Lord gave them a gift, and they got up and read the Bible, and they explained it. And, man, they did a pretty good job. How did you do that? A lot of training? No, I, I don't know. I'm not really sure what happened there. I just kind of did the best I could. And, and I've heard lots of guys and gals like that. And the only explanation for it is this idea of, uh, of teaching or gifting uh, in, in operation. It can be a great, great blessing. Uh, again, the gifts vary from one person to another. Uh, again, are all apostles? No. Nope. Are all prophets? No. Nope. Are all teachers? No. Nope. Are all workers of miracles? Uh, have, uh, have all the gifts of healing? No. Nope. Do all speak in tongues? No. Nope. Do all interpret? This is all from 1 Corinthians 12, 29. The answer rhetorically obviously is no. Not everybody all has the same gifts. They're given by God. Um, three, we should use our gifts in such a way as to fulfill the, their purpose. And here's where we want to look at the, uh, the seven gifts themselves. The first one mentioned is, uh, is prophecy. This word in the Greek means to speak before. And so because of that, speak before. Some would say that means then, kind of got to throw a little, a little thing onto this, that means speak before and they throw on a crowd. So therefore they simply equate uh, prophecy with preaching. <clears throat> and, uh, and certainly prophecy is involved probably in, uh, in preaching uh, and teaching. But prophecy is, is simply uh, hearing from God and then delivering the message from God. It can be a, we'd say, a, uh, a foretelling. Sometimes it's of a predictive nature. And again, we, we wanted to do a real thorough study. We go through the book of Acts and see this. Sometimes it's of a predictive nature. Uh, Agabus tells Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, this is going to happen to you, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, sometimes it's just a foretelling. It's just, uh, uh, it's just uh, a word or it's a phrase or it's a little thought that's meant to, well, Paul gave us the definition of it. It's got to be there for uh, the encouragement uh, or the exhortation or to bring comfort. Uh, if it doesn't fit in one of those three categories, then it's not a prophecy and it's not from the Lord. Uh, and Paul tells us and gives us the instruction when somebody gives a prophecy that we're supposed to listen and see if that aligns with the word of God and the character of God and then judge what we, we hear. Uh, and so therefore, when somebody, and I have people come up to me uh, periodically and go, oh, Pastor, I was praying this week and I got a word from you and I think they mean a word of prophecy. Uh, and great, you know, and they tell me what it is. I'm under no assumption that it's really the Lord. But it could be, but it could be. So I listen very carefully. Uh, and sometimes it, I think it probably is uh, because I was praying about that very thing. I was concerned about that very thing. And it just like, man, it just fit like a glove. That was from the Lord. What a blessing. Thank you. And other times it's like, okay, well, peanut butter on Thursdays. I, I may hold off on that. I'll, I'll see. You know, that's God bless you. You know, it's just like, wow, I don't know where that came from. See, our problem is uh, sometimes in, in churches where uh, 
uh, this is really emphasized as the prophecy is given in King James with a quivering voice. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. You know, it's like, you know, if the guy's really good at it, it's like, appreciate that was from the Lord, man. You know, I mean, I got chicken skin. I don't know about you. It's like, well, you know, so, you know, it doesn't help if the guy tries to psych you out with the way, the way he's, he's giving it. But that, sometimes that's the way it, it comes across. Uh, but it's supposed to be given in such a way so that we can rationally kind of think this through. Uh, is it really from the Lord? And, uh, uh, and many of you uh, may have that gift. and The Lord may speak to you for it. It could be a blessing to someone else. So would that take faith to walk up to somebody and go, you know, I had, a, I had a word this week, you know, from the Lord. And I just might be a blessing to you. I, I thought it takes some faith. Well, what if he thinks I'm an idiot? Well, he might think you're an idiot, you know. So trust the Lord. And, uh, uh, but a beautiful gift that could be a, a tremendous blessing. Uh, what's the purpose? It fulfills a spiritual need. Prophecy fulfills a spiritual need in our lives. Ministry or serving is task-oriented. It fulfills a, uh, a practical uh, life. I call, I call people that have this gift, uh, they could do a Nike commercial because they just do it. They just do it. They see something, they just do it. Uh, they come down the hallway and the, the lights burn out. They find one and they put it in. They just do it. They don't go to say, do you have a light bulb committee? <laughs> well, not, not actually. Well, uh, how would I get the funding for a new light bulb if we needed a new light bulb? Uh, well, I guess you, you know, I don't know, talk to Bonnie. Maybe we've got some petty cash. Wait, what do you need? There's a light bulb. Here's five bucks. Go buy a new one. Put the bulb in. Is that all right? <laughs> Trust me, it's all right. But, uh, you know, the people that have the gift aren't even asking. They're, 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 they're on their way to Safeway to buy the thing or whatever. Uh, uh, and we could go other examples, but it's just, again, it's just, we all, we all want to be helpful. We all want to be serving uh, the servant nature of Jesus. But people that have this gift, are, they, just, they just go take care of it. They just, they just uh, uh, do it. Uh, Gary was down here yesterday morning loading somebody's uh, leftover furniture that they dumped by the dumpster on the top of his red truck. And, and uh, we uh, got, it, uh, got it to the uh, dump and tossed it and everything. But uh, he's been doing that for months, trying to make sure people don't dump stuff back there. Is that because I asked him to do that or told him to do that? No, he just saw it and said, man, we're getting rid of this stuff. You know, hauling stuff to the dump. Is that, is that like high on your list for spiritual gifts? That's it. But it's, it's over the top. Uh, Gary's awesome with stuff like that. When, and when you see that, you just go, that, that, that's the Lord. You know, it's just a spiritual gift. I'm not sure I want that one. <laughs> Dumb? I don't know. <laughs> teaching. Teaching meets uh, an intellectual need. Uh, it instructs the mind. It's concerned about knowledge. And, uh, and it's probably, probably, in a sense, a, a problem uh, in the body of Christ because there's probably not enough teaching because it's supposed to be intellectual. It's supposed to uh, meet uh, the uh, intellectual needs that we have to grow in the knowledge of the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to learn the scriptures in context together. Uh, because a lot of times on Sunday morning what you hear is actually exhortation, which is our next gift, which meets an emotional need. So a sermon that simply meets an emotional need uh, is exhortation actually not actually teaching but what the body of Christ needs uh, it actually is more probably a little more teaching uh, from, from the Bible uh, and again the, uh, the teaching you know, could be a gift uh, f- uh, particular for, uh, for kids and, and if you want to see somebody that's gifted teaching kids uh, if you could be a, a fly on the wall watch Tricia with those kids over there those kids come alive even, even after about a month, they start changing and they're excited about what they're learning and stuff. She's very, very gifted at it. And, uh, and again, these are, you know, we can have natural abilities and, and so forth. But when it comes to the Bible and spiritual things, when, you, when it's kind of over the top, it's really, it's really just the grace of God. And it's, uh, it's from the Lord. Uh, exhortation, as I mentioned, uh, encouraging uh, and uh, uh, is the idea to come alongside is what it uh, literally means. Uh, certainly a great gift if somebody's involved in, uh, in counseling or ministering to others on an individual basis. Uh, again, meets an emotional need. And uh, uh, if you, you kind of wanted to see what that looked like, you could go out to the ice palace and watch some parents teaching their kids uh, how to ice skate for the first time, put the skates on, they get out there. 
given the fact they both can uh, ice skate. Uh, and if you watch them, uh, their, their kid in between, sometimes the skates aren't even on the ice because they each got one hand in there. That's a picture of encouragement to come alongside and lift someone up and give them the ability to go forward and be able to do something they wouldn't be able to do uh, otherwise. Uh, and um, a very, uh, very important, uh, important gift. And, and, and you can, you know, try, I'm really fighting the, uh, the temptation to, to be telling all of you what your spiritual gifts are as I, I see them uh, in operation. But uh, uh, would you say that my wife has the gift of exhortation? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and uh, that's why people want to be with her, talk to her, hear her, because she will lift you, lift you up. And a little exhortation sometimes as well. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a gifting uh, from, from the Lord. Uh, giving it meets a, a financial need, obviously. Uh, the idea of generosity or with simplicity uh, refers to the, the motive of giving. There should be a, a single motive and it should be for the, uh, for the glory of God. <clears throat> and some of you have the gift of generosity. And it's a blessing. I I, uh, I don't see what people give in the church. I don't want to see. I, uh, I, uh, I see a little statement at the end of the week, just the, the amount and kind of uh, how, we're, how we're doing. Uh, and sometimes uh, there's a note if, uh, if there's something that's just like over the top, like when somebody puts a $10,000 check uh, in the uh, offering, they figure maybe I should know that. And that happens. Uh, there are people with a gift of generosity. Uh, in the body of Christ, uh, in, uh, it's huge. It's uh, it's a blessing. No alternative motives. They're not asking for their their plaque on the wall, you know, given in the name of and uh, and so forth. As I uh, built windows in churches for years, there was always sometimes I would have to meet with the donor whose plaque was going to go under the window I built, and I didn't I didn't care as how I earned a living. I was just there to build the window. But I, I understand, you know, the the, the mentality. But that's. Uh, that's not what's being spoken about uh, here uh, with a single purpose. Uh, leadership, this meets uh, organizational needs. And certainly uh, uh, we need people that uh, exercise spiritual leadership in terms of uh, uh, people that are leading, uh, leading ministries, that are uh, overseeing things. And the idea is uh, when you do it, don't just wing it. <laughs> the idea when you do it, uh, you know, be serious uh, about it. Uh, it's for the Lord. And then uh, mercy uh, meets physical needs. Again, takes many uh, forms, uh, hospital visitation, aiding the poor. Uh, and the idea of when you do it, uh, do it uh, cheerfully or with, again, uh, the right attitude. Nobody needs to be in a hospital room, have you come visit and have you say, you look terrible. No, that's that. Is that exactly. People do that. People do that. Uh, that doesn't help uh, any, you know. And uh, so with the right, the right attitude and with the, uh, the right purpose. And the whole point is that if we sometimes try to function serving the Lord to a capacity that we have no aptitude for, no gifting for at all, it's frustrating. It's hard. Wow, this serving the Lord, this church stuff, this is kind of a drag. Well, maybe you're just... Uh, you're, you're not built for it in terms of spiritually. You're not gifted in that area. Maybe you need to rethink through your own giftings. And sometimes you don't know what they are until you get out there and do it. I, I would dare say, I would dare say there's nobody that thinks they have a, a, a gift of teaching until they taught somebody something. Pretty sure I have that gift of teaching. Teach anybody yet? No, nope. but one of these days, pretty sure I got the gift though. No, I think you're going to have to actually teach to find out, for example. And uh, uh, it's, as we get out with faith, without pride, with the love of God, and serve the Lord, we'll kind of di discover. Can I take a test? Yeah, they've got tests. But uh, if you're not really sure, ask your husband or wife. They could probably tell you now. I mean, if you're around someone long enough, these things begin to uh, manifest themselves. Uh, and uh, they are to be used... Uh, to encourage others and to build up the body of Christ. Well, again, it's not a, it's not an exhaustive uh, list. We've got more in other areas, and uh, you know, Chuck's got some great, uh, great books on it. Charisma versus Charismania, I think, is a book. Living Water is excellent. A little longer to go through these things, uh, and it's an important subject because uh, we need to function uh, within the gifts in order to have a uh, a healthy body. 
Uh, at the same time, I understand because of the abuses and non-biblical ways in which gifts are manifested uh, within a, quote, given church service or church settings that I can see why people are going, oh, I'm not really sure all these people are on their rockers here, you know, because there's some strange things uh, going on. I, my, both my grandmothers were Pentecostal. I, you know, I've I experienced a, a lot and everything. And, you know, these are wonderful people that love the Lord. Uh, but they're, they're just not following the dictates and very specific <laughs> instructions that are given in Scripture. Uh, and so it's uh, important that we're biblical uh, in what we do. Uh, but at the same time, we should not just throw the baby out with the bathwater, but eagerly desire and seek spiritual gifts. Now, Paul saying that to believers tells me this, uh, that you may have a spiritual gift now, that maybe you're using or maybe it's just kind of dormant you aren't using it's not to say that God can't give you another or others and I think he does that when we step out to serve him he gives us what we need when we need it uh, and it's not so much always well if you give me this gift this gift this then I'll be good to go then I'll start doing no it's uh, get out there in faith and love without pride, begin to serve the Lord serve by serving others, and you might be surprised at the gifting that God continues to, uh, to give you, uh, and, and then an increase in that uh, uh, measure of faith and uh, capacity for that gift and how it might be used. God is my heart, I cried to the Lord and He lifted me up, He feeds my hunger, He fills my cup. This love will uphold me, my God is my rock. God is my rock, His love is strong. He heals my wounds with the strength of His song. He quiets my trembling, He leads me on. His arm will defend me, my God is my rock. My rock, my rock, though my defenses fall apart. My rock, my rock, though mountains fall, my God, He is my rock. My rock, though fears tear me apart. My To the Lord and He lifted me up. He feeds my hunger, He fills my cup. This love will uphold me, my God is my rock. God is my rock, His love is strong. He heals my wounds with the strength of His song. He quiets my trembling, He leads me on. His arm will defend me, my God is my rock.
he quiets my trembling, he leads me on. His arm will defend me, my God is my rock. I don't know. 